this talk, uh, the title of this talk is Myths of Market Failure. And um, maybe I'll give you a little uh, history of economic thought background uh, on this, since I've, I've, since I've published articles and things on this whole thing over the years. And, and um, uh, one of my articles I published, uh, co-authored with Jack High when, uh, back a long time ago when we were both at uh, George Mason, uh, it was about uh, antitrust and competition. And uh, one of the things that we points we made in there is that until you get to the 19, 1930s, really, uh, people, economic writers who wrote on a subject of competition and monopoly law was relatively new. The first federal antitrust law in the U.S. was 1890. And, uh, and I think it was the first anti-monopoly law in the world, actually. Uh, and then other countries followed suit. Most e economic writers thought of competition like the Austrians did and do today as a dynamic rivalrous process of entrepreneurship and discovery. That's basically, uh, and it's an ongoing and dynamic process, a you know, never ending process. They didn't think of competition in those days as perfect competition with all those assumptions of many firms uh, perfect information, homogeneous products, and all that. That came around the 1930s. And so, uh, you know, as long as uh, economists understood this, that this is the nature of markets, uh, there wasn't a big literature on market failure. But that all changed with, <clears throat> with the advent of the so-called competitive model, where, uh, you know, the economics profession began trying to uh, imitate the physical sciences, physics in particular, uh, and to to construct mathematical models of competition, so all of a sudden in the 1930s <clears throat> and thereafter, the markets hadn't changed, but the theory of markets changed. The 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 benchmark of uh, of efficiency became the perfect competition model, and so all of a sudden there were all these books and things uh, written about how markets fail. And part of it was uh, motivated by the existence of the Great Depression and the uh, the impulse to blame capitalism for the Great Depression, not and not the Fed, you know, anything but government, and and not not the massive 15 years of government intervention in in the United States that that caused this. It was capitalism. Okay, and so there were all all of a sudden all these books, and so it became a real industry you know, within the economics profession in the 30s, 40s, 50s, especially in market failure. And, uh, and so in, in one of the, uh, and what it created is what um, the economist Harold Demsetz called uh, the Nirvana fallacy. It led to this fallacy called the Nirvana fallacy. And this, uh, this language came from a, an article that Harold Demsetz, he's a, a UCLA economist, he passed away last year. But he was, he was, he was a great economist. He was, he was a fellow traveler of the Austrians. He would never, he never called himself an Austrian. But uh, when I was in graduate school 115 years ago, uh, shortly after they, they slayed the last dinosaur uh, out in Montana somewhere, I remember reading about it in the school newspaper. Uh, uh, but I, I read, I was a big fan of Demsetz's research, mostly because it was, it was very Austrian-like and it was very applied. And it was published in places like the American Economic Review. And so, but anyway, this one article of his, it was, I think it was 1969 Journal of Law and Economics, and it was a de debate with Kenneth Arrow, who was a Nobel Prize, one of the early Nobel Prize winning economists, Kenneth Arrow, and uh, they were debating over market failure, and, and uh, Demsetz used this phrase, I don't know if he was the first one to coin it, but he used the phrase nirvana fallacy to say that, well, this is the method of analysis that Kenneth Arrow was using. And at the time, he was using Arrow as uh, an, ex you know, an example, a very prominent example of the, the type of analysis that went into market failure analysis. Okay. Now, what is a nirvana fallacy? Well, it's basically 
uh, establishing some sort of benchmark for efficiency, perfect competition. And, and you think of the old uh, assumptions, the original assumptions of this model uh, of the time, many firms, whatever that is, many, well, it's many, uh, perfect uh, or homogeneous products, everybody produces the same thing. Homogeneous prices, everyone uh, charges the same price. Perfect information, uh, you know, consumers know everything there is to know about the market and producers know how to minimize costs and maximize profits. Uh, and so forth. So that's perfection. And so, and the method of analysis was to assume that that's perfection and then compare that to the real world. And then the real world inevitably fails everywhere. And uh, in uh, this article that I mentioned with Jack High that was published in uh, Economic Inquiry way back in 1988, when I was just five years old. Um, just kidding. She thinks I'm serious. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, 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 we we mentioned. Um, I, mean, I lost my train of thought since I made a joke. So, I, so, I joke. Uh, so, so anyway, in this uh, this article, uh, uh, the Nirvana fallacy. Let's see what point I wanted to make here. Well, yeah, the, the debate with with uh, with Demsets. He was making the point that uh, this is really a a bad method of analysis. So, you know, it's dishonest. He didn't say dishonest. I think it's dishonest to point this and never, never achievable ideal and compare the real world to it and say the real world fails. And then oh yeah, the point I was going to make is that we cite in this article uh, some literature, some books that were celebrating, celebratory, and, and economic journal articles they said things like, at long last, we have discovered that, that, that there's market failures everywhere and, and we can now con construct a positive government program to save the world from market failure. It was, it was, it was really ridiculous. I, I thought they were, they were celebrating. You would think if they, if they discovered that there was, uh, the, the wheels were running off of the economy, they wouldn't be so happy about it. But the econ these statist economists at the time uh, were. And so it was a big deal, and that, and that led to you know, the publication of books by uh, Edward Chamberlain and Joan Robinson on monopolistic competition, which is sort of like uh, jumbo shrimp or uh, military intelligence. Uh, if you don't like country music, it would be country music, you know, if, or whatever, you know, maybe whatever it is, uh, as far as that goes. And so, uh, and even uh, an old Chicago School Law and Economics scholar, the late Robert Bork, who was also a federal judge, he wrote a big book on antitrust economics. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite lines in the book is, uh, is when he said, if the government actually tried to force perfect competition on us, it would have the same effect on the economy, roughly, as several strategically placed nuclear explosions on the economy, if we, if we really took this seriously. But that became the method of analysis. And uh, here's like one simple example of, of the method of analysis. There was a, a, a literature on innovation, product innovation. And this was sort of a, a takeoff of monopolistic competition. I'm not going to get into monopolistic competition. But uh, in the 70s and 80s, there, were, there was a, a, whole, a, a literature in the economics journals it was, I always considered it sort of a footnote to the theory of monopolistic competition. It was highly critical of technological innovation claiming it created monopolies. And the simple, you know, Econ 101 analysis, this is the uh, textbook monopoly diagram and from the, you know, principles of micro textbook, a monopoly model. You know, you know, monopolists will equate marginal revenue and marginal cost and, and decide that this is the profit maximizing level of output here and charge the monopoly price. And, but if this were uh, competition, they would, this would be the marginal cost curve here would be the supply curve, and here would be the, the supply and demand. That would be the, the equilibrium quantity here, QC. And so uh, there was this literature that basically said innovation uh, needs to be regulated by the state because it creates monopoly. It should be you know, part of anti-monopoly regulation. Because, and, it, and most importantly, what does monopoly do? It restricts output and causes a deadweight loss. There's a deadweight loss, and the loss in consumer surplus. Okay. And uh, uh, Demsets came out and made uh, what, uh, what seemed to me to be a pretty obvious point. He said, hold on now. What you're saying is that 
if maybe a hundred people had the idea at the same time, okay, for this innovation, then you would have Q sub C. That would be the output. But that didn't happen. Somebody did it first. Therefore, you have QM. Yeah, so, so what you're doing is you're comparing this utopian ideal where a hundred people, a light bulb, the same light bulb went off in their heads uh, simultaneously, and therefore they all invented this product and put it all in the market at the exact same moment, perfect competition. And you compare that to the real world where only one guy did it, and the real world fails. And Demset says that's, that's the, an inappropriate comparison. What you should be comparing to if you're concerned about output production is today, okay, let's say the, the invention comes on the market tomorrow. The appropriate comparison would be today when you have zero output of this product compared to tomorrow when it's invented and you have this much, QM. Okay, there's an expansion of output. There's not a restriction of output. The invention and innovation expands production in the marketplace, doesn't restrict uh, reduction in the marketplace. And of course, it's always going to be that way. If you, if, you, if you make this assumption of perfectly competitive equilibrium that everybody had the same invention. And so that's, that's an example of the nirvana fallacy that leads to, uh, in, in, invariably, it always leads to uh, recommendations for more regulation, more control, more government uh, uh, outright production of resources. And this is kind of related to uh, another type, a more modern version of so-called market failure for which um, Joseph Stiglitz, among other people, uh, and somebody else uh, won uh, a Nobel Prize in economics. And this is called, uh, called asymmetric information. So, yes, some of you who have taken microeconomics may have heard of this supposedly form of market failure, the fact that we all, we all have different information. But uh, 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 one of the original articles on this, on asymmetric information, uh, was uh, uh, on what's called the lemons problem. It was an article that, that claimed that uh, used car dealers have more information about the cars than the buyers do. Therefore, they're likely uh, to sell you a lemon. You know, lemon is being a you know a word for a, a car that has some sort of problem. You know, and, and the engine's going about to blow or something like something like that. And then this, and then the prediction that came out of this article was that the used car market the uh, you know, people would catch on that they're selling you lemons, and uh, and so the used car market would disappear. Uh, the the, uh, the author of this was um, Bruce Ackerloff, who's the husband of Janet Yellen, the former Fed chairman, and uh, and so that was the lemons problem. was published in the American Economic Review, and so and, but what what he didn't mention at the time. This was published in the early seventies, and at the time, uh, the warranty market had solved the lemons problem. You know, the used car dealers had warranties that said, you know, if you, if, that exist today. If you go to uh, CarMax, which is, you know, a big used car sales place in the United States, and you buy a car, and the last time I did, I bought and sold several cars to this CarMax, and uh, they used to give you seven days to bring the car back, uh, no, no questions asked if you don't like it, and they give you all your money back. And so that solves the lemon problem. You're not going to buy a lemon. You have plenty of time to take it to a mechanic uh, and, uh, and, and, and make sure you weren't sold a, a defective car. And that existed when a Akerlof wrote, wrote the article. Okay. And so I, I published a little article about this um, years later. And I want a, a short quote from von Mises on, on this, on this point of, of saying that this is a, uh, a market failure, and, and, and keep in mind, the market failure has to do with this point that uh, everybody has the same information. That's that is said to be a desirable thing. You know, talk about nirvana. And if I can find, uh, here's what Mises said. Uh, <clears throat> Mises said this: the adjustment of prices to every change in the data would be achieved at one stroke. So that's what he's talking about that the market, everybody knows at the same time, at one stroke there's a change in the marketplace and that everybody knows about it at the same time. It is impossible to imagine such uniformity in the correct cognition and appraisal of changes in data except by the intercession of superhuman agencies. We would have to assume that every man is approached by an angel informing him of the change in the data. 
you know, you know okay, an angel. Um, uh, moreover, even if market participants did possess the same data and information, they are bound to appraise it differently. So even if the angel did come and give us all the same information about this new product, let's say, uh, we would all appraise that information differently because we're all different. And so, in other words, it's, it's a human impossibility to think that people would all have the same information. And of course, asymmetric information is why markets work. It's, called, it's another word for it would be the division of labor. You know, the, who knows more about how, how to uh, uh, manu manufacture an automobile? You or the automobile manufacturers? Who knows more about how to build a house? Home builders or you? Uh, you know, everything in your life, when you think about it, the, the reason we have human civilization is the international division of labor. But somehow people like Joseph Stiglitz have sort of confused this and called it uh, asymmetric information leading to market failure. But it's, it's really, uh, you know, in the, old day, in the old days, maybe 50 years ago when we were in the machine age, the language we did use was division of labor. But there's also a division of information. Now that we have a more information age economy, you know, we can talk about this and more in terms of the, the uh, division of information, uh, you know, in the, not just a division of knowledge uh, or addition, you know, division of labor, rather. And I also quote Hayek in the same article because Hayek, way back in the 40s, also was writing about this, about the, the, the undesirability or the unreality of, of all this. So that's one type of, uh, of uh, market failure problem, the nirvana fallacy. And it's, it's pretty pervasive in, in a bunch of the literature. And just think of that perfect competition model and you know, all those unrealistic assumptions. And I assume Peter Klein probably mentioned that. And there's, there's also uh, a good literature now. now. Another point before I proceed, though, is um, the way the economics profession handled this. I gave you a little bit of a history lesson earlier talking about Dem sets and all these people, is that when the public choice school came along in the 1960s, basically, the economics of political decision making, not everyone here, I assume, knows what public choice economics is. Maybe you've run across it in a textbook. What they did basically was to basically accept the uh, market failure literature and say, okay, we accept all this market failure literature, but let's apply the same criterion of Pareto optimality to uh, government because government allocates a lot of resources too. And so they, they, they claim to have constructed a theory of government failure to work alongside the theory of market failure. And uh, Harold Demsetz, who I mentioned earlier, he calls this comparative institutional analysis. So a lot of the, the research that you would find in the, by the Chicago School Economist, published in the Journal of Law and Economics, the Journal of Political Economy, uh, goes by this type of methodology of uh, assuming, uh, you know, without even challenging the market failure uh, uh, analysis, take a look at, well, well, what's the alternative? How is government likely to, to uh, is it likely to do better or worse? And of course, the big theme of the public choice literature is that even if there is, quote, failure of markets, uh, <clears throat> governments will fail orders of magnitude worse, typically. Uh, and so if you compare the two institutions, your, your, you know, the method of analysis would be to make a decision on which is less perfect, not comparing perfection to reality, but imperfection to imperfection. That's sort of the method of analysis. Now, there's another strain of research that has challenged, always challenged the market failure. Of course, the Austrians never accepted the perfect competition model as a model of competition. They've always been around, always had that that view. They never changed their view of competition as a dynamic <clears throat> rivalrous process of entrepreneurship. But there are a lot of other economists, Chicago School and elsewhere, and Austrian economists, who have done a lot of applied research uh, looking into all the uh, various theories of, of, uh, of market failure. And so I'm going to talk about some of them and maybe um, pique your interest into to looking up some of this uh, literature. And one, one old article is, was uh, by um, Ronald Coase, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist from Chicago. He's not an Aus Austrian, but his famous article about the lighthouse was, uh, uh, it's still being debated actually in economics literature, but the, 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 I, always, I always thought this was a great type of research uh, that, I, that I really appreciated because 
Coase uh, did what um, the market failure economists typically did not do. The market failure literature became very highly mathematized, very highly quantitative. Uh, you know, typically uh, an article would be published in a, some um, highfalutin economics journal with 116 equations to prove that markets once again fail. And, uh, and there would be not a bit of reality in it, no, no case studies, not even no statistics, all, all theory. And, and so for many, many years, the lighthouse was used as an example of a, a free rider problem, market failure due to a free rider problem, the theory being, uh, you know, once a light is shined over a harbor, uh, it provides, a, it creates a public good. And so the next ship to come by has no incentive at all to pay for the public good. Therefore, you, you will have an inadequate provision of lighthouses in the world. And in textbook after textbook that was used. And, and so in, in Kosa's uh, article, it's called The Lighthouse in Economics, you know, published a long time ago in the Journal of Law and Economics. I'll take one short quote by Paul Samuelson. In Paul Samuelson's famous textbook, it says, take our earlier case of a lighthouse to warn against rocks. Its beam helps everyone in sight. A businessman could not build it for a profit since he cannot claim a price from each user. This certainly is the kind of activity that governments would naturally undertake. And that was Paul Samuelson's textbook, which was the biggest selling textbook in economics in the world from 1948 until the 1980s. And all during that time, all the, all the top competitors for that textbook were basically clones of Samuelson's textbook. So this is what generations of economic students were taught as a, a quintessential example of a, of a market failure due to the free rider problem. And so, uh, but Coase did the unheard of, unheard of at Harvard and MIT anyway. He got up off his swivel chair in his faculty office and went to the library. You know, you know can you imagine a professor, you know, at a distinguished institution like that, walking across campus to the library and reading a book? Oh my God, that's, uh, what is this world coming to? They're supposed to sit in there behinds for, until they die, uh, uh, playing with mathematical models, if you're a, a, an MIT economics professor. Well, anyway, basically what Coase found, he did a, a case study of the British lighthouse sy system in history and found that uh, private enterprise had built uh, private lighthouses you know, in, a, in antiquity and, uh, because it was in their own self-interest to do it. Uh, they were entrepreneurs, and, uh, and they knew... Uh, it would be very dangerous to uh, ship cargo from America all the way across the Atlantic to England and then have a storm pop up at the last day of the voyage and, and have their ship crash on the rocks. And if they weren't sufficiently insured, they're, uh, you know, they're up the creek without a paddle, so to speak, maybe literally up the creek without a paddle if that were to happen. And so and that's in a, in a nutshell, that's what Coase, Coase found. So I just wanted to bring some of this uh, literature to your attention. And at the end of his article, he says this, and you know, after quoting Paul, the great Paul Samuelson and, uh, and, and, and another Nobel Prize winning economist saying this, Coase says this, the question remains, how is it that these great men have in their economic writings been led to make statements about lighthouses, which are misleading as to the facts, whose meaning if thought about in a concrete fashion is quite unclear, and which to the extent that they imply a policy conclusion are very likely wrong. Okay, and well, he basically says what I just said, they're lazy, they, 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 they didn't look around, they didn't, they didn't do the research. Okay, and that's why I, I'm mentioning this particular type of, uh, of research. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a couple more examples, and what runs through these examples that I'm gonna mention of, of this is that these stories of market failure tend to ignore three main things that they all seem to ignore. Is one, the dynamic nature of markets. They, they tend to take a snapshot at a point in time of a market and, they, and, they, and they, they're unhappy with the outcome because it's not perfection. They also tend to ignore, not always, tend to ignore entrepreneurial discovery. Because after all, if there is a problem like not enough light in the harbor, well, surely it's, it, it's in, it, in somebody's self-interest to solve that problem because there's going to be money in it. 
in solving that problem, especially if there's there's money in it. Why wouldn't they solve? Them? They don't they don't need some professor from MIT to tell them that how to make a buck. Uh, you know they're they're gonna they're gonna work at it, and the human mind, uh, uh, you know, often will succeed in doing that. That's what entrepreneurship does. Uh, and also they they tend to ignore uh, history and reality because they're just overly theoretical. Not all of the literature. No, there's there's plenty there's case studies and things in literature. But the literature that Coase was talking about and Samuelson, uh, like I said, they, they tend to think that theory is enough, but theory is not always enough. Uh, at, least, at least the Chicago School and its, uh, its positivism, at least it, it uh, proposed testing these theories. And the testing is sometimes very dubious, but, but at least they, they, they made some attempt to uh, enter the world of reality to test the theory and see if it could, it could explain things in the world. But a lot of the market failure literature is just pure theory and it doesn't make an attempt to do that. Another example, another example for years, uh, road building. You know, uh, Walter Block, who's not with us, we call him our roads scholar because he's for, for the past 50 years, he's been making the case for the privatization of roads everywhere. He has all sorts of wild schemes, underground super highways and everything. and. It seems to be zero opportunity cost economics, though. That's because these highways he talks about. It seems to me would cost trillions of dollars to build. But anyway, uh, but for a long time uh, there was a uh, a free rider problem story, you know, public goods story about roads. Uh, it said that you know you need you need uh, government funding of roads and highways uh, for, because it's a free rider problem. That you know, if once the road is built and if uh, if it's difficult or impractical to have a toll everywhere and charge people, there'll be free riders and, and you'll never be able to raise enough money. And so I would uh, refer you to, there's one other article I'm going to mention on this that I thought was kind of a, uh, a neat article because of the method of analysis uh, that was done, you know, which is good sort of Austrian school analysis, even if the authors don't call themselves Austrians, although I know one of them does. Let's see. It's called the, um, or, or this author does, used to anyway, the voluntary provision of public goods, question mark, the turnpike companies of earlier early America. It was an economic inquiry uh, some years ago by Daniel Klein. And, uh, and Danny Klein was an undergraduate student of mine at George Mason 116 years ago, back right before they killed that last dinosaur. And at the time, he called himself an Austrian. I don't know if I haven't seen him in years and years. I don't know what, what's that? You guys know Dan Klein? Has. No, no, I have two classes. No, I haven't seen him forever. I, the last time I saw him, he was a kid. <laughs> he was like you, uh, but it's been a very long time. But I, but I really like this article because, uh, you know, he, he did what Coase did. He, he, well, they're... Well, let's see here. Well, early America, uh, they have a problem with roads. So the business people who have invested their everything they've got in a in a in a business, they're they're not interested at all in building a road. There's no money in it. There's no money in somebody building a road connecting two towns so that all the merchants in the two towns can prosper, and and so forth. And so I'll read you one quote from this. Uh, that what he found. This is early America, the early 1800s. Between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies built and operated about 3,750 miles of road. New York led all other states in turnpike mileage with over 4,000 miles as of the year 1821. Pennsylvania was second, reaching a peak of about 2,400 miles in 1832. New Jersey companies operated 550 miles by 1821. Maryland operated 300 miles, uh, on and on. Uh, turnpikes also represented a great improvement in road quality. So basically what he discovered was that while people were saying, uh, in the, the economic historians, that um, government was absolutely necessary to build uh, roads, uh, private entrepreneurs had built, already built thousands of miles of roads. In, in, in early America, and they were mostly toll roads. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, how the entrepreneurs uh, got this to work. They used social ostracism. If you were in a small town uh, and uh, they bought stock, the people of the town bought stock, 
even though he says the, the rate of return on that uh, Turnpike Company stock might have been 3 or 4%, and you could have earned 8 or 9% somewhere else, but they did it anyway because they realized it was more than the 3 or 4% that was going to be their profit because their business would now survive, their business or thrive, because it was connected to a bigger market. You know, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, as Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations. So when you expand the market, you expand the division of labor and you prosper more. And so they, rec they recognized that. And so they, they, they were able to raise enough money through the stock market to have these uh, profit-making turnpike companies. Uh, another famous article in this literature is uh, The Fable of the Bees by Stephen Chung. How many of you have ever heard of this? A couple of you, a couple of, yeah, okay, just a couple. Okay, The Fable of the Bees, subtitle is An Economic Investigation, you know, another old Journal of Law and Economics uh, uh, article. Well, this, this is also uh, the same type of uh, research that, that I kind of like a lot because it's, it's a combination of good applied price theory, good applied economics, and uh, people who are willing to work hard and, and research and use um, their economic vision to, uh, to research the reality of these markets and their industry studies or market studies. The problem here was supposedly a situation where you have the proximity of an apple orchard and beehives. Okay, the bees pollinate the apple orchard and uh, therefore the apple owner, the apple orchard owner makes more money because the apples are more prolific. And so that's a positive externality imposed on the apple orchard owner. At the same time, the apple orchard nourishes the bees. So the beekeeper gets more honey from the bees. So there's sort of a reciprocal positive externality with the proximity of uh, beekeepers and apple orchards. And again, uh, he, uh, Stephen Chung uh, quoted, he was, he was teaching at the University of Washington uh, at the time. This is long before the Antifa riots in, in in Washington State, okay, and uh, and he quotes all these big shot Nobel Prize winners, uh, Francis Bator. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was tortured by having forced to read this big book on market failure by Francis M. Bator, and uh, but uh, he's, here's what he said about this whole situation: It's easy to show that if apple blossoms have a positive effect on honey production. Any Pareto efficient solution will associate with apple blossoms a positive uh, Lagrangian shadow price. If you haven't taken mathematical economics, you don't know what that is. If then, but don't worry about it. If then apple producers are unable to, pr to protect their equity in apple nectar and markets do not impute to apple blossoms their correct shadow value, more math econ lingo, profit maximizing decisions will fail correctly to allocate resources at the margin there will be a failure by enforcement. This is what I would call an ownership externality. So he invented a new type of market failure, ownership externality. And this was typical. So you, if you, if you, when you get to the chapter of the microeconomics textbook on externalities, it was typical that this would be used as a, one example of a market failure due to an externality problem. And so once again, Stephen Chung did the unheard of. He got up off his butt. And here he is in Washington State. If you went to the local Kroger department store in Auburn today and bought some apples, you'd probably find some apples over there from Washington State. It's a big apple growing place. So he was sitting there right in the middle of the you know, apple growing mecca of the, the American West. And so he started investigating the apple industry. And lo and behold, he found out that the entrepreneurs in both the beekeeping industry and the apple industry are not as dumb as the, these Nobel Prize winners in economics thought they were, okay? And what he found basically is that for generations, they had very specific contracts already worked out where uh, when the apple blossoms are about to bloom, in, in bloom, uh, we, will, we will pay you to move your, your, uh, your, your, your beehives next to my apple orchard and, and we'll all benefit from it. They had very specific things that said such as, uh, we'll give you two weeks warning before we're gonna put any pesticides on the blossoms, on the apple trees, so you get the bees out of there and it doesn't harm the bees. And this had, ex this had existed for decades and decades, he said. And so like I said, 
there's this seems to be this penchant uh, on the part of the market failure theorists to think that uh, entrepreneurs are just either dumb or non-existent and that you know there's big money to be made here and they're just going to walk away they're not they need they need government to force them to make money <laughs> to force them to make. and we do have government subsidies to beekeepers to this day and I'm, I'm not sure if it came from this these theorizing but but we do have these policies in the US uh, like this okay um another of my favorite um articles that is very Austrianish by people who don't don't necessarily call themselves Austrians, Neither, uh, as uh, Stephen Chung did. He was a Chicago school guy. But, uh, but, uh, but this is the type of economic history, I think, that uh, Austrian economists have done and, uh, and should do also, is uh, who recognizes this configuration? What what is that? That's the keyboard. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the configuration of the keyboard. This this too. There was an economist named Paul David who uh, he was at the University of Tennessee at the time. I looked him up recently. He had some kind of joint appointment with Stanford and Oxford, which sounds pretty prestigious uh, to me. And uh, anyway, he wrote an, an article, uh, one of the first, claiming that this was uh, uh, a, a, a new type of uh, market failure called uh, you know, path dependence, that somehow the, uh, uh, the market, the consumers adopted this configuration of com uh, keyboard even before computers were invented. This was typewriters. And uh, I learned to type on a typewriter in my day. And, uh, and so uh, they had just gotten rid of the stone tablets. I remember seeing them all out there in the schoolyard in the playground. They threw them all away finally and, and bought uh, typewriters. So I, I remember taking a whole class in ninth grade and typing on an IBM Selectric typewriter. And it's probably the most valuable class I ever took in public school is learning <laughs> to typing because I became a, a world-class speed typer by, by doing that. We competed. We, we used to have competitions even out of school of, uh, who can type the fastest without uh, making mistakes and for money. We put money down and, and that, uh, that's what Italians do, everything like that. Everything's a, a gamble. Uh, so... So uh, anyway, uh, so Paul David uh, said, well, this is a market failure because there is a superior uh, type of keyboard and it's obviously superior. We have research that shows it's superior and it had a different name. And the name doesn't have to do with keys. It's the man's name. And this man's name was Dvorak. So there existed, you know, in the early days of typewriting, uh, the different types of keyboards. He didn't have all the same like we do, like we do now. And... Uh, I, I gave this, I talked about this in a talk in Czech Republic a few years ago. I was invited to talk at the, the Prague University of Economics. And when I mentioned Dvorak, the students all kind of giggled because it's a Czech name. I don't know why that was funny. That I, I thought it was funny that an American would know a Czech name, I guess. And, uh, August Dvorak, he was an American, but he was of Czech heritage. But, but anyway, uh, these... <clears throat> Two economists that are have done a lot of a lot of good uh, good work, good research. Let's see. I'm gonna get this. Stan Leibowitz and, and uh, Eric and Steve Margolis and Stan Leibowitz is is their names. And uh, they wrote uh, they they have a, a book on uh, on Microsoft. Like it's called Winners, Losers, and Microsoft which is um, yeah, a fabulous book, it's the kind of book that Austrian economists should, should research and write, in my, even though, once again, they, I don't think they would call themselves that. But they were students of Harold Demsetz at UCLA. So, um, so I think there's, there's sort of this hidden connection. I think Demsetz would have, uh, maybe if you tortured him and he, with electric shock or something, he would have said, okay, okay, I'm an Austrian. But uh, <laughs> because he, a lot of his research was, was like that. But uh, anyway, they researched this. And, uh, and to see, well, is it true? Is it true that there's you know the the these stupid consumers have uh, adopted this inferior technology? And they looked into it, and one thing that raised a big red flag is they they looked into where this where this these studies came from that Paul David cited, and here's what they found. And they quote this is a quote from uh, from them. They're saying. 
Let's see. Oh, here it is. He said, well, there might be a conflict of interest here. Uh, they're talking about some author. It doesn't matter what his name is. This author identifies Dvorak as Lieutenant Commander August Dvorak, the U.S. Navy's top expert in the analysis of time and motion studies during World War II. Then there's a man named Earl Strong, a professor at Pennsylvania State University and one-time chairman of the Office of Machines section of the American Standards Association, reports that the 1944 Navy experiment and some Treasury Department experiments performed in 1946 were conducted by Dr. Dvorak. So the studies claiming that the Dvorak computer keyboard is superior to the QWERTY keyboard were conducted by Dvorak uh, with his typists. And so that doesn't mean it's not true, but that means, well, there's kind of a conflict of interest there. And it so happens that Dvorak owned the patents on the keyboard and had received at least $130,000 from the Carnegie Commission for the studies of the keyboard. So that's kind of like, you know, General Motors conducting, comparing General Motors cars with Toyotas and declaring that uh, we've done a scientific study and we've come to the conclusion that General Motors cars are superior to Toyotas. And in a, take that with a little grain of salt, wouldn't you? And so, and so did uh, uh, Leibowitz and Margolis. And so they, they did other studies, and they had other studies, and they found, they, con they concluded that the QWERTY keyboard might be very, very marginally better in terms of the quickness of typing, not huge, but that's what the market shows. And so uh, no, they didn't see a, a path dependence problem there. And I argue, I would argue there that the real problem of locked in inferior technology is with government. That's where you lock in technology because once the government chooses the technology, uh, you automatically have all the special interests that coalesce around it, the manufacturers, the suppliers to the manufacturers, the members of Congress who represent the district where the manufacturer is located. And you provide a, you know, a political cabal that will defend and protect that technology no matter what. That's why we have so many airplanes in the United States Air Force that the Air Force knows are ineffective, but they keep them anyway. That's why uh, I'm, I've been working on a paper on that. I was supposed to give it at the Austrian uh, Economic Research Conference, which was canceled, but, uh, but uh, I had a whole bunch of literature that I, that I dug up on this, on uh, obsolete government technology. And probably the worst example, or the most uh, uh, spectacular example, is that until just about a year or two ago, the American nuclear arsenal used seven inch floppy disks. Now, now you, I don't know how many of you know, even know what a floppy disk is, but this is 1970s era computer technology. Uh, and and like in the first computer I ever bought was an, uh, an IBM PC in, right in the early 80s. And say if I was going to co-author an article with you and you lived a thousand miles away, I would put this floppy piece of plastic in the side of the machine and I could copy my article that I just wrote on it. And then I would send you in the mail the floppy and then you could do your part. You could add your part to the article that we're co-authoring. And then in the 80s, they adopted hard disks, like three and a half inch hard disks. But these are seven and a half, seven inch floppy disks they were, they were using for the, the nuclear arsenal until just, just like two years ago, they finally, I read an article, they, they changed that. And so, you know, talk about locked in inferior technology. And uh, you look at the public schools, the stupid school buses. They look, they, they look the same as they did 60 years ago. And uh, the, 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 letter, the mailman, the U.S. Postal Service trucks, they haven't changed since I was two years old. You know, they have the exact same technology. And so that, that's where the real problem is. Okay. And so uh, we're about out of time. It looks like uh, I always tell people if I'm the, if I'm the last uh, speaker before lunch that I got a standing ovation because everyone stands up and goes to lunch after, after the room. And uh, we have one minute if, if there's a question or two about something. I got one minute left, I guess. So with the, the, the solution to the public good problem, it's essentially saying that there still are free riders, right? It's just that free riders don't prevent entrepreneurs from Well, entrepreneurs sometimes are very good at solving free rider problems. 
you know, what are what is private charity about? You know, we have thousands and thousands of private charity that produce things that a lot of economists would consider to be public goods. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, just in, a, in the Fourth of July, I'll give you one example. The Fourth of July in my town, it was it was very strange. You know, usually the city government pays for a fifteen minute fireworks display. I live in a beach town right on the Atlantic Ocean, and, uh, the, and there's a big fifteen minutes fireworks display. And, uh, and then that's it. But this 4th of July, I was walking around town at 9.30 at night, and it seemed like everybody's yard had a, firework, a private fireworks display. And there are examples in textbooks of a public good being fireworks. You know, once they're provided, how can you exclude anybody from looking at the fireworks? Public good, free rider, therefore we have under-provision of fireworks. There was no under-provision in Delray Beach, Florida, of fireworks. And I even put on the Lou Rockwell blog a helicopter, a news helicopter in Los Angeles was flying over L.A. And, and there were just millions of fireworks going off, even though the city of Los Angeles was, didn't do it. They canceled because of the plague, you know, and so, and so it was canceled. So, so yeah, entrepreneurs, maybe they won't solve every single free rider problem in, in, in the history of the world. But it's, it's, my point is it's, it's been greatly exaggerated as, as a problem by ignoring those three things dynamic nature of markets, entrepreneurship, and reality and history. You know, not, not looking at, you know, has someone solved this problem before? It's, and if you rely too much on theory, that's, that's the sort of the hole that you dig yourself into. And that's, I guess we're out of time, so uh, thank you very much.